two, we are live. What is going on, everyone? Welcome back to another Tuesday live spirited here on Sanctorum of Spirits. My name is Sam Nashreen. I am your host at the Scribe of the Spirits. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and you can try my space, but I think that got shut down again. Uh, I need a better intro. <laughs> What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another Tuesday Live. Uh, today, we are going and hanging out in the house of Suntory. We are going to be tasting more than the whiskey, though. Uh, we get to taste the Haku Vodka and the Roku Gin, which I'm really excited for. And my guest this week is Mr. Jonathan Armstrong, the West Coast brand ambassador for the house of Suntory. Uh, hey, John, how are you doing? I'm good, Sam. Happy to be here. How are you doing today? It's actually a pretty good day. It's a pretty good day, you know. Aside from just tasting some dope spirits, it's just been a pretty good day. Right. Glad to hear it. But we're also going to get to taste some dope spirits. So that, it's just much more better. <laughs> much more better indeed. And we're also, guys, um, we are going to talk about, of course, you know, the Suntory line. But one thing that Jonathan and I both had agreed upon is that we wanted to discuss Japanese whiskey and spirits kind of as a category. So we'll get in a little bit further along into some of that, you know, category definition and talking about the recent announcement from the Japanese Spirits and Liqueur Makers Association. Um, so we'll get into that. One thing you will not hear today is either of us talking bad about any brand. Um we're going to be focusing brand-wise, of course, on the Suntory products and, you know, just on the categories as a whole. So without further ado, Jonathan, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your role with Suntory, and how you got started in this whole crazy world of Japanese booze? Yeah, um, and thank you for asking that question. Mostly we just usually just kind of dive into the spirits, and I'm, um, I, I love a good opportunity to talk about myself. Um, <laughs> so with an Instagram uh, name like Million Dollar Strong, I'm not surprised. Well, you know, I I get shy on social media. There, I think I have all of four posts, um, and it's a dangerous game these days. Um, but ask me questions about myself, I, I light up. So um, I've been in the food and beverage industry for over ten years now, coming up on eleven or twelve. Um, I'm originally from the East Coast. And I kind of got into it um, right after college. I moved back after the Great Recession and, and was kind of like a young man who liked to, um, I, did, I like to stay up late at nights, um, more of a, not really an early riser. And I was looking for something to kind of geek out about. So I got um, sort of linked up with some people doing cocktail bars in Philadelphia. And that really kind of put its hooks into me. Um, so I was really fortunate enough to work at some of the, the best bars in the country and, and probably the whole world. Um, the Franklin in Philadelphia, and then I opened up the Nomad in New York way back in 2012. Wow! Uh, so that yeah, that was a long time ago, and it's weird to to say 2012 now because that's that's almost that's coming up on 10 years. Um, but then I also worked wow. at Maya Well, which was the first real craft cocktail bar that had a focus on tequila and mezcal. Um, and I also worked at Death and Company in the East Village for about four years. There's probably nine now, or ten other bars. Village is the original Death and Company, right? That is that is the jewel in the crown. That yes, it is. It's it's really a great neighborhood in in New York too, because um, you have right on the same block. You have Death and Company. You have Amoria Margo. Um, you have whatever they've put into that whole complex next to Amoria Margo. Now I think they actually just expanded. You have PDT a couple blocks away. You have Pouring Ribbons a few blocks away. You have Angel Share a few blocks away. It's really kind of, um, if you're going to go on a bar crawl for famous cocktail bars, it's probably the best place that I know of to do it. When so, I was in New York, the most famous place I went to was down to Battery Park to Dead Rabbit and then over to Blacktail. Gorgeous bars. Absolutely gorgeous bars. Those guys really know how to um, build a room, so to speak. I would I would love I to really go antique shopping with them. <laughs> right. <laughs> I really hope Blacktail makes a comeback. You know, I'm not sure what they're doing with it right now. I know it did close at, what was it, Pier 52, right? I, I, can't, I can't remember. It's been about four or five years since I lived in New York. And, and sadly, I'm getting to the point 
where my memories are, are starting to disappear, not just fade. So I, I can't remember not, justice, not but it, it was definitely on the pier somewhere. I just don't know if, if it was pier 52. I don't remember. It was pier something or other. If anybody in the comments section knows, you know, please feel free to drop a comment and uh, let us know where Black Tail was. Um, so you moved from Philadelphia to East Village and then East Village moved to L.A.? Yes, sir. I got offered a, you know, around that time I had been in New York for nine years. I also went to school in New York. I went to NYU for film. Um, but it, it had been like nine or 10 years living in New York and it was kind of ready for a change at the same time that someone offered me a job. So I got the opportunity to kind of learn a little bit about a different side of the industry to go work as a distributor. So I worked with a company that was called Henry Wine Group and is now Winebow. Um, selling a lot of really great, beautiful boutique spirits, um, really kind of focusing on stories and small producers um, because that's all they have to sell. They don't have budgets, so to speak. Um, but a lot of mezcals, a lot of tequilas, a lot of brandies, a lot of rums, pretty much everything except whiskey. Um, <laughs> but I had had, a, I had had some friends back in New York who, when my predecessor, um, a man you definitely know, Johnny Mundell, he moved over to Makers, um, they, you know, they kind of tapped me on the shoulder and said, Hey, by the way, this position is opening up, you know, you should, uh, if you're interested, you should apply. I said, yeah, quite. Yes. Thank you. Yes, I will. <laughs> um, and that began about a six month process of just kind of hanging out, uh, waiting for phone calls, sending lots of emails, updating your resume, all the fun stuff that it takes to, to land a job and really just kind of, um, waiting and waiting and waiting until finally they gave me the, the go ahead and said they'd like to bring me into the Beam Suntory family and be a, a representative for the House of Suntory. And it has been the best gig ever, ever since. Um, very, very, really very fortunate to be able to have my job and kind of travel up and down the West Coast and sort of sing the praises of Japanese whiskey. Now, actually brings up an interesting question. What was your relationship or fondness towards, if any, Japanese whiskey and spirits before joining the Beam family at the House of Suntory? Sure. Um, it's, it's a fair question. I had an immersive, immersive um, connection with Japanese whiskey uh, before that time, if only because I lived with the East Coast ambassador, my counterpart, um, the senior brand ambassador, Gardner Dunn, for about Gardner five Dunn. years before I took my position. So he was the person who tapped me on the shoulder. There's a little bit of nepotism there, but it, it kind of works in my favor because I had done events for Suntory in the past. Well, you know, if, you, if you're familiar with the products when you're talking about them in the interview, it always helps. Um, if you've done events for them in the past and, and, and they know that you're a hard worker, it always helps. Um, and, you, and if you have a general idea like of the aesthetic and kind of um, how they like to present themselves, it, it definitely helps, so. You know, it was, it was, it's not like I had a, a man on the inside or anything, but I definitely had a familiarity with what they were looking for. I have yet to meet Gardner, uh, but I hope to, when I get out east, uh, when travel's allowed again. I hear he's a good guy because my buddy is the New Orleans on-premise channel manager, I think. I don't remember his title. He just got a pay raise and job bump. Pay title bump. Uh, you may or may not know him, Joe Medier. It's it's out of my region. I'll I'll probably meet him if I if I haven't already at some point. Someone I'll, I'll look out for. But yeah, tales. I'm hoping you know this year. I think it's still all going to be virtual. But maybe next this year. This year is still virtual. Uh, yeah. Hopefully next yeah. year we can go back. You know, uh, Camper English. For those of you who don't know Camper, uh, he is the man behind Cocktail Safe. It's a great website that tells you, you know, hey, this is safe to use in a cocktail or, hey, you know, maybe don't use this in a cocktail because, you know, like charcoal. Charcoal was like the hit thing for all the using cocktails, but activated charcoal actually counteracts medication. So if you're like taking, you know, heart medication or in my case, you know, like anxiety medication, activated charcoal will just the medication will bond to it and it will be washed out of your system. Um, so he recently put up a jokey post saying, I survived one year without liquor brand swag and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. And I said, I survived one year without getting drunk at Tales of the Cocktail or getting drunk in, in New Orleans in July and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. 
I thought uh, it was funny. No, it, it is. It's just, take, I'm just going over it. It's, I'll take New Orleans every time, man. I love that city. It's a rad town. Um, and I definitely, I just, you know, it's, it's one of those few times of the year, like I haven't been in the industry for a, a while at this point where, you know, people you open up this bar over here with and have now moved to that side of the country yet friends in Portland and this sticks out in Washington and Chicago, New Orleans, Austin. It's, it used to be, and you know, it had some, a few troublesome years. The one time of the year where you would just, everybody would be in the same place. And it was the hardest thing to do was just make a plan for the evening because you, you start with one thing and then you get jump into a cab over here and then you get pulled. Oh, we're going here. Are you coming? Or are you going? Are you going or coming? You gotta decide, decide right now. Cause it's, it's happening, it's happening. In the cab or not. Okay, all right, I'll catch up with you later. And it's just like that really fun I energy. I eat the rest of the week. Yeah, it's, I, I just, I, I miss it. Uh, I don't, I don't miss Honestly, I do. drinking so. that much, but, or the heat or the things like that. But I, I miss the, the Aaron Rose and Cure and all those fun bars and, and all that deep fried food and oysters. Okay, so last year, uh, I think you were probably there. The crazy storms that were happening. Uh, I was in the French Quarter and I had a seminar to go to at the host hotel, which was not the Montleone. It was the Sinesta. The Sinesta, the Royal Sinesta. yeah. Uh, but I had gone to an activation for a different vodka brand at this place called the Audubon Cottages, which was only like a 10, 15 minute walk like through the French Quarter, like just outside of, like it was in French Quarter, but like it was like on the other side of French Quarter. And as I'm there, it starts bucketing down rain. Oh, yeah. The sky opens. No, the sky like burst, not opened, like it burst. And I'm there in jeans, a polo shirt, and like, my non, my nice, you know, not nice, but like my good, like non-slip work shoes. It was like the only pair of shoes I had at the time. Aside from like my nice boots, which I'm glad I didn't take with me. Um, and I'm just getting absolutely drenched. I have like a soft shell vest from North Face that I'm wearing. And that's just getting absolutely drenched. I run into this little store and I buy a poncho and that saves my ass like on the outside, but my shoes and socks are totally drenched. The rest of the day, I'm walking around in, like, damp clothes, and it's so uncomfortable. But I would totally do it again if I had the opportunity to do it right now. We, we, we've been talking about it. It's been building up all these memories. And this is a weird thing to, like, long for, but, like, I long for, like, the smell of old absinthe house, which is just, like, old beer and shit all over the walls. And just like every cross section of humanity and different kind of people in the same kind of space. I mean, I, I might just be missing a bar right now, but I particularly love that bar because I mean, it's like the unofficial. If you get lost, walk by that place and you're going to run into a friend and you're going to, you're, oh, absolutely. You're safe and recovered. It's either Absinthe or Aaron Rose. Uh, I long for Chart Room um, because that is like my <laughs> go to in the French Quarter. <laughs> I uh, I Cash sold my soul to a bartender at was... Chart Room. Oh, yeah, it was 2012 or 13, and I was with Frank Cisneros, um, who's uh, adorably uh, adorable hipster bartender, um, and quite a curmudgeon. But we were all drinking, and I, it was my turn to go get a round. And the bartender said he'd give me a round for if uh, for my soul. I, I sold my soul to a bartender at a chart room in 2012 for a round of uh, Miller High Lifes. For Miller High Lifes? Not it was three in the morning. Not even anything, you know, expensive? I, what, like some uh, Abita Purple Haze or something like that? No, man, it was 3 a.m. Yeah, something. What'd you do? <laughs> All right, we spent like 15 minutes talking about tales and reminiscing. We should probably start talking about the vodka. Yeah, um, let's do it. Let's talk about Centauri, man. So before we get bottle. into the actual vodka, I have a bone to pick. Okay. The label says gluten-free. Why? All distilled I mean, spirits it, are gluten-free. Yeah. Also why this are one. you trying why <laughs> is Centauri trying to capitalize 
on that, you know, over sensitivity, you know, over like, you know, oh, I'm gluten intolerant. Oh, I just don't like gluten. Or, oh, you know, I want a gluten free vodka. Why perpetuate that? Why not just say prove that's like, yeah, we're vodka and, you know, all vodka is gluten free. Why not just educate on that? Why, you know, perpetuate that whole gluten free thing of, you know, oh, we're a gluten free vodka instead of, you know, all vodka is gluten free. I'd probably say because it's really difficult to put everything you just said onto a label. Uh, in, in short, uh, you are absolutely correct, and it's one of my pet peeves. Um, all spirits, by definition, are gluten free. Um, gluten is protein; it can't survive the distillation process. Doesn't matter what raw material it's made from. Um, we put it on our bottle because, I mean, it's not wrong. It is accurate. Um, I think it also helps prompt a conversation about the raw material, what this vodka is made from, which is rice, um, which even when it's not distilled is gluten-free. Um, so I take it as that. It just gives me a, a sort of like another prompt, another way to start the conversation towards something that actually is much more important than, than gluten. So I hear you on that. Um, but that's the reason. So we can't put it. Can't put the full story on the label, um, and it helps us tell our story, you know, or at least gives us uh, an avenue to do that. With that being said, you want, shall we talk a little bit about it? Please, sir. Or do you want to talk? A, or do you want to talk a little bit about the the house of Centauri in general? Or how how do we do this? This is Why my first we... time. No. no, you know. So yes, for first time joining me. Uh, this is just a conversation, man. You know, two cool. spirits, geeks, spirits, nerds chatting. One of us just happens to work for Suntory. Um, but, like, honestly, just casual. Okay. So, if you well, want to talk about the vodka it, and then keep... go into Suntory, if you want to go to Suntory and then talk about the spirits, whatever you want, man. I'm going to try some of this vodka, I... though. This is my first time having Haku. Yeah. Well, let's, let's, let's do the scatterbrain. Let's go all the way around the world. But it's the journey that makes it worthwhile. And we'll just kind of we'll pick it we'll pick it up maybe uh, the Suntory stuff when we get to the whiskeys. But what you're trying Sounds is good. Haku. Um, it is was launched in 2018. Um, Haku means white, brilliant, radiant. Um, the beautiful thing about Japanese kanji, uh, and try and get, uh, can't quite get it, but you got one right there. Uh, is that they have multiple interpretations, kind of just based on how the brush strokes are done. So each one of our labels has an original piece of artwork that we commission um, for the kanji character. Uh, the only one that's different is really the Roku. That's um, a Kurokana character as opposed to a kanji. But the long story short, it doesn't just mean uh, or is just a reference to white, brilliant, purity, things like that. It's a reference to what it's made from, which is Hakumai rice. It's one of those clever kind of twists oh. on words. So, What's interesting about our vodka is that one, it's rice based. Um, there aren't a lot of rice based distillates that are above a certain proof in the world. This is one of the few. Um, I'm not sure if we're the only one, but we're definitely the most prominent one. And really, with this this vodka, we wanted to kind of over invest in what went in the bottle and tell kind of like a story of the history of Japanese distillation, um, as opposed to you know just like put it, making the bottle a foot and a half tall and won't fit on a shelf except the top one and, you know, you know, covering in gold plated leaf and all that other nonsense. Um, so we just really over invested in the actual spirit. So how did we do that? It's kind of like a bold claim, right? Well, first off, we start with the Hakumai rice and we polish the rice in the same way that you would for a sake. So you are removing that outer husk and just getting the, the pure starch in the center of the rice kernel. Um, that, that sort of gives it a more delicate flavor. And then we do something that I believe that no other vodka in the world does, which is that we ferment it using koji. So um, we'll get into koji probably a little bit later when we talk about the new Japanese whiskey regulations, um, I'm, I'm guessing. But uh, in Japan, for all intents and purposes, koji is like the national yeast. Um, it's actually a mold, but it it's absolutely everywhere. It's in traditional soy sauces, it's in kombucha, it's in miso, it's in the vinaigrized rice used for sushi, it's everywhere. It's a huge part of their cuisine. So knowing that, we kind of start the fermentation um, with koji, and then we do something else that no other vodka does, which is that um, 
we have an intermediate step, which is we turn it into shochu, which is the other most uh, traditional alcohol in Japan besides um, sake. So it kind of goes through like a sake-like um, step on its way to shochu. Um, and shochu, you can make from anything, uh, sugar cane, sweet potato, barley, which we'll talk about, I'm sure. Uh, we made ours from rice because we like the flavors and we knew where we were gonna take it. Um, finally, at that point, we do something that I believe also that no other vodka in the world does, which is we send the, the spirit traveling. We send part of it to our Osaka plant, we send part of it to our cheetah plant. And this is a big thing that I kind of want to hit on it um, and kind of uh, educate people as much as possible, which is that every single thing that you have in front of you there, and really every single one of our spirits, is a blend of different distillates. That is like the key hallmark of the House of Centauri. It's the art of the blend. Um, so we make a big, huge, full-bodied vodka, and we make a light, elegant, sort of soft, delicate style vodka, and we blend those two together so that you get the best of both worlds. There's a final step involving bamboo charcoal, but um, that's that. Those are really the kind of the key elements that where we really tried to overinvest in each step of the process and make this um, spirit as good as it possibly could be. Backing up real quick, uh, you mentioned that you take the koji fermented rice and turn it into shochu. Mm -hmm. For people watching who aren't familiar with that process, can you describe it and explain what that actually means? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I'm gonna love this conversation if you keep asking ones like that, the super nerdy ones. Um, I never get to talk about them, but it's, it's essentially that uh, a shochu fermentation is very different from say a classic fermentation that uses uh, yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Shochu, uh, they start with a sort of like a steamed rice. They apply um, different types of koji, which can be black, they can be yellow, they can be white, they can be red. Um, and they sort of sprinkle it on the rice as a starter. And then there's a very long, complicated process of simultaneously mashing and fermentation, but it's, a, and they do it in stages as well. Um, but it's, it's very particular and it's very regimented. It's called the Shubo method. Um, and it's essentially, they're creating uh, a starter that turns, that is a micro batch that turns into a mini batch. Um, that which and when I say mini say like you know a few hundred gallons and then they really kind of cultivate that fermentation that inoculate over several days to several weeks and then they finally add that to their full batch which is when they get into that the full proper fermentation and it's a way of cultivating the right types of, of bacteria and mold and the right types of yeast and controlling the strains um, in a very ancient process uh, and then they finally um, do they do their distillation in a completely unique way where um, it changes kind of depending on where you are in Japan. You have some places that are like Filipino style stills. If you're if you're a mezcal fan where you have like literally wood stills and then you have other places like in Kagoshima where they're stainless steel and they're vacuum stills. They're distilling um, under much, much, much reduced pressure. And that adds texture and body to the spirit in a different way. So it's very complicated. It's very different. It's very um, unique in a number of different ways. So uh, we we do that. We we do we tend to do like the vacuum. I believe we do exclusively the vacuum method in stainless steel, um, but also doing that shubo method. Why stainless and not copper? Because they don't they don't need to remove the the sort of like the sulfites from and the sulfur compounds that you have in fermentations with yeast. It also um, I believe they don't they don't have to make the same cuts that whiskey distillers do. Um, so it's 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 just a different process um, in general. Uh, and also they're running them at different temperatures for different times. You know, the conductivity is is on stainless steel is still pretty good compared to uh, to copper. There are a lot of tequila producers that use stainless steel stills and then they use a copper part of the still somewhere, maybe like in the condenser. Or, or just in the second distillation. Um, but stainless steel gotcha. in general is kind of, it's, it's, it's uh, in a lot of different places in the world is a preferred um, material for stills just because it's so durable. Um, it's not preferred in a lot of whiskey making though. That's super cool. I had no idea because, you know, I dabbled mostly in whiskey and I'm just trying to expand into, you know, other spirits, agaves, vodkas, and gins. 
So I'm used to hearing about, you know, our copper scale, our copper pot scale, our copper column scale, copper, 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 to the point where I assume that everywhere and everyone used copper, except for, you know, like more ancestral mescaleros, which are using, you know, clay stills, oftentimes I find. Well, yeah, that's the new definition for um, ancestral uh, mezcal. But, you know, there are many, it, 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 Mexico is a weird place to kind of talk about in terms of distillation because there are so many different micro regions and micro styles. So like you have some places that do, like literally distill inside a, a tree trunk um, or a wood still that's meant to emulate a tree trunk like in Michoacan. And that's the style there. But they, a lot, a lot of those producers, there's different, there's differences even then, like some will use a condenser, it's internal capture and internal condensation where the lid on the top will be made of copper, but it also depends on the vessel size. So if you have a really large still and you have a really long distillation, a lot of times you can't do copper on the, on the top because it, the copper starts to oxidate by the end of the distillation and you get little green globules in your, um, in your, in your mezcal. Whereas if you have a much smaller still, Sometimes the ones I've seen that they will have copper as an element because the distillation process goes that first, that second one goes a lot faster and they can still get that copper contact, even though they're using a wood still. It's, it's, it, distillation is fascinating all over in different regions throughout the world. It's really a lot of fun to, to nerd out about. And I, I like to do it in case you can't tell. <laughs> well, you and I can nerd about. I can't words. You and I can nerd out about distillation more uh, as we go further on, but I want to go back to focusing on the haku because this is really delicate and it's really beautiful. The first thing I noticed was how creamy and rich and oily this was. It's like what I'd imagine, you know, a semi-liquidized coconut oil would feel like drinking it in your mouth. Yeah, you know, I mean, like vodka by definition, it's, it does, it's not going to have any flavor, um, color, or aroma. But that doesn't mean it can't have texture. So that's really kind of the purpose of the, of the blending process. It's to get that texture and that mouthfeel. Um, and I, I would probably pull back. I wouldn't call it quite so oily, but at, so much as like mouth coating. Because to me, that's when a lot of times you get a lot of craft vodkas that want to do um, a big full-bodied vodka, and they tend to blend a lot of the tails into the, from the cuts, and they and they get it that way. But with that, you get a lot of fusel oils um, and things of that nature, the, the heavier elements, the tail end of the distillation. Um, whereas this, it's it's trying to get that texture through um, use of koji, use of soft water in the distillation, the use of um, black bamboo in the filtration, and then just making different weights of distillates and, and blending them together. But I'm really happy you like you like the texture. That's kind of that's kind of the point I feel on this one. So before we get into the bamboo charcoal, which I want to talk about, uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, actually, the TTB recently changed the laws on vodka, so it's no longer a colorless, odorless, flavorless spirit. Because it's never been what that. Do, what do they call you it? Know, most good vodkas, I don't remember offhand. Um, while you start talking about the bamboo charcoal filtration, I'll go look that up real quick. But... It's really cool they actually updated that in the last year so that it's no longer, you know, required to be colorless, odorless, flavorless. Okay, that, that, that's news to me. Well, uh, I, I guess I was kind of operating under the uh, historical traditional assumption, the kind of the things that define the category for, for most people. I mean, of course, there are flavored vodkas and things of that nature. Um, and there's bison grass vodka and infusions and things like that. But yeah, let me know on the new stuff, but I'll take your invitation to talk about black bamboo charcoal. So bamboo charcoal is kind of like a, a wonder product over in Japan. Um, it's everywhere. Uh, you can use, because you can use it for so many different things. Um, you can put it into your water and it'll filter it just like a Brita. Um, you can put it in your fridge and it'll deodorize it like baking soda will. Um, what, Pretty much all vodkas are filtered to kind of remu remove the unwanted congeners and impurities and things like that. But what bamboo charcoal does is that because it's a natural form of charcoal, it's not a, an activated synthesized charcoal, um, it also imparts things to the spirit as well. So it adds trace amounts of minerals. 
that again sort of add those that texture and that mouthfeel to the vodka um and for me also give it like a little bit of sweetness in the finish without it being syrupy um and that's kind of the role of bamboo charcoal uh and why we specifically chose it for haku um, and we've been using it for quite some time um, in some of our other products gotcha yeah you know it's just interesting for me the mouthfeel on this is totally not what I was expecting. And I don't think I realized that Haku was made with rice. You know, there's a lot of great things that you can do with rice. You know, like you talked about the vinaigrette rice used for sushi, you know, steamed rice, shoshu, um, Haku, even. You know, it's just, it's kind of cool. Yeah, it, I mean, it is, it is kind of like the staple food of Japan. They've been... Um, they've used it for a very long time. They have a lot of familiarity with it. So it makes sense that there would be so many different applications for it. Um, and, you know, it's not also not all created equal. There are lots of different heirloom types of rice um, throughout Japan as well. Um, when you start getting nerdy out about sake, it's very intimidating very early on the amount of um, differentiation between each region and styles. And then they start getting into heirloom varieties. And then that, yeah. It's um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of know-how um, and there's a lot of familiarity and really that whole culture is all about subtlety and nuance on the palate, which we'll see with some of these other spirits. But it also makes sense that that would just naturally extend itself to a vodka as well, um, and th and that they would kind of really lean into the thing that's um, most interesting about a vodka more often than not, which is that texture. You know, talking about sake real quick the nuances and different types of rice and stuff as you were saying, just hearing that gives me greater respect for those people who the Japanese government have dubbed with the title of sake samurai. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm, it's, they're, they're, it's one of those countries and one of those cultures where, you know, people apprentice for 20, 30 years um, and they're yeah. happy to. It's, it's, it's a part of cultures everywhere that's disappeared. Um, and the sake I mean, industry the specifically. Chief Blender for Centauri, Shinji Fukuyo san, is fantastic. How long did he apprentice for? I mean, if you asked him that, he'd probably say he's still learning. He'd, he'd say something really humble. Um, but he took <laughs> over, I believe, in either 2009 or 2011. Um, and it, I, you're asking me a, a question of like, I, like all those guys have worked at Suntory their entire lives, you know, so 25, 30, 40 years. Um, and when when they work in terms of like the blending room, it's, you know, it's five or six of them working underneath the chief blender. So the his predecessor was um, Seiichi Koshimizu, um, who worked, I believe, from 19, early 1990s or late 80s until 2009. Um, when he was really forced to retire. Um, they have very strict retirement guidelines uh, in Japan. I heard about that, um, yeah. I, I think it's because they have they have such an, uh, an aging population that, and they're so hardworking that if people didn't force people to retire, uh, there would never be any job openings anywhere. <laughs> so 30 years, uh, give or take, is probably. Um, they Most of those guys also have a pretty similar story where they like, went to Scotland, they studied at Ariat Watt, um, they worked in different parts of the distillery over the years and then eventually made their way to the blending team and then um, just kind of gotcha. uh, slowly slowly rose to the top. Now, before we jump to the Roku, I have the, the new definition for vodka here. Um, it's more specific, but also more encompassing according to food and wine. Vodka is neutral spirits may be treated with up to two grams per liter of sugar up to one gram per liter of citric acid. Products to be labeled as vodka may not be aged or stored in wood barrels at any time except when stored in paraffin lined wood barrels and labeled as bottled and bond. Vodka treated and filtered with not less than one ounce of activated carbon or activated charcoal per 100 wine gallons of spirits may be labeled as charcoal filtered. So it's, I mean, it, I don't know how I feel about that definition. It's, it's almost like they, they're defining it by what it isn't as opposed to actually describing it what it is. Maybe, that, maybe that's 
leaving the door open for things in the future because it, that, that used to be that it is not has no aroma has no flavor has no color and they've removed that and they've just said it it can't be aged in a barrel and if you're going to say charcoal it has to have this certain amount so i mean i guess it's less restrictive it's less restrictive and i gotta disagree with you i feel like it's better because otherwise haku technically would not meet definitions would not meet standards of identity because it's not colorless i mean it's colorless but it's not without texture it's not without flavor yeah i i think those were always pretty uh uh, there's a bit of salutary neglect when it came to those regulations and most, most like TTB and most people who kind of just approved spirits were more concerned about labels and then whether or not, whether or not you met the, the distillation standards, um, and things like that. So I don't know, but perhaps for vodka, but definitely not with whiskey, especially well, because they want, definitely the you know, bottled and bond. Yeah, there's plenty of more, plenty more restrictions when it comes to whiskey. But in, in the vodka category, when you're probably have like, I don't know how many new vodkas get released a day. I don't, I don't really think the TTB cares much. Do you? <laughs> probably not. So, Let's move on to the Roku. Just, yeah. So Roku means. Oh, those are going uh, down a rabbit sense. hole. We're not going to come back from. I, I, there's going to be many of them, man. We're just going to have to dig ourselves out over and over again. Um, but Roku means six in Japanese, and it's a reference to the six traditional Japanese botanicals that are in every single bottle. Um, and if you ever need help remembering what those are, I can see you staring at the back of the bottle right now. We put them on the label for you. Um, they are uh, <laughs> Am I cherry obvious? blossoms. I can just read your eyes, even through the camera. Um, even through the camera. But uh, they're cherry blossom leaves and petals, which are harvested in the spring. Two types of green tea, Giyakura and Sencha, um, which are harvested in the in the summer, rather, and Sencha, sorry, uh, Sancho pepper, which is harvested in the fall, and finally Yuzu, which is harvested in the winter. And the reason I kind of went um, seasonally throughout the year there is because to kind of um, capture those flavors, we use an idea called Shun in Japanese cuisine, which is incredibly complicated, um, but it essentially boils down to uh, using the highest quality ingredients from the best producers in the best regions at the perfect time of year. Something perfectly easy, not at all. Um, and the way that we do that is by making micro distillates from those um, different botanicals. But what's really interesting is that this gin is actually, if you take a step back before we make those micro distillates, this gin starts its life off as a classic London dry style gin, um, which not a lot of people know about. So it is juniper, coriander, um, cinnamon, angelica root, uh, cinnamon, I already said cinnamon, uh, citrus peel, things like that. And it is a classic sort of like piney backbone um, London dry style gin. The only difference is that we distill the juniper twice. So it's you a little less resiny. I was gonna ask you, I was gonna ask him like, so to be, I was gonna say, you know, because you only list six botanicals here and the way it's phrased, to me, at first glance, it makes it seem like it's only these six. I was going to ask you, what about the juniper? No, it's 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 in there, man. It's uh, it's it's that's its own distillate. Um, so essentially, uh, neutral grain spirit, throw in juniper, do a distillation, throw in the rest of the botanicals. You have your London London dry style gin. Now, as I said, everything from the house of Suntory is a blend. So that at that point, our blender of our spirits, Kazu Tori um comes in and has sort of exerts his influence where we have these different mi micro distills where what's really cool is that we're actually using different methods too so the yuzu is its own distillate it goes into a copper pot still and there's actually a heads heart and, and tails cut and a huge portion is discarded which is not normally what happens with gin distillation you just kind of like you do like a basket method or you do a maceration method and you run the stills hard and fast and that's it um, and you get your extraction. Uh, so th discarding a huge amount of distillate with the yuzu is actually quite un unusual. That's one thing that we do. With the Sakura, it's actually even weirder. So you remember those vacuum stills for uh, yeah. the, um, that we use for the shochu? We have a vacuum still right. at our Osaka plant and, we, and we, put a, we make a single botanical distillate from just the petals of the cherry blossoms, the Sakura petals. 
um, and it's basically distilling at room temperature. You can put your hand on the still and it really gets this nice soft floral note um, that to me adds uh, a floral note without being like super soapy, like you get from a lot of craft gins or like sort of smelling and tasting like bad perfume, um, which is always something that you see with too many these days. But Tori blends those all together and what comes out is Roku gin, which to me is very versatile because it has those new flavors, but it also has that typicity to kind of use a wine word um, that you can put it into a Negroni or a Martini and still gonna have like a gin flavor. Now, quick offshoot. You mentioned your chief blender, Kazutori, was it? Kazutori is, Kazutori Kazutori. is the chief blender for our, um, our spirits, yeah. Our, our white spirits and, and things like that. Any relation to Shinjiro Tori? I don't think so. I think I remember asking um, and he basically said, no, not at all. He's not like a member of the, the family that goes back to Shinjiro or uh, the current master blender Shingo um, or the Saji family as well. Uh, I think it's just one of those things where he might be like a distant cousin or uh, not really at, at all. You know, it's like, D different countries gotcha. have different common last names. I'm not the. I'm definitely not the only Armstrong in in Los Angeles, California, <laughs> United States. There's too many of us, probably. I'm not the only green in Los Angeles, California, or the United States. Yeah. So. Um, I'm not the only it's, green it's in the LA odd. hospitality industry. Yeah, and you're probably not the only green on your block. You know, <laughs> it's it's just one of those <laughs> things. He's and he probably gets. He's probably sick and tired of answering that question at this point. But he was very sure. kind and nice and, and, and elaborated for me. This reminds yeah. me of Sip Smith. In terms of the, in which parts of it? In, the aromatic of it, you know, the juniper, the spiciness of it reminds me very much of Sip Smith, which I know is another beam gin. Obviously, like I said, London, London dry style. Yeah, um, and I, I mean, I think it, it's probably because um, it's just two products that are are both doing at least part of their distillation in copper. Um, they're they're also a pot still copper gin, if, if I remember correctly, um, and at least a portion of our distillate goes through that process. Um, just people making well balanced uh, craft gins. We're not, I mean, we're not really sharing any botanicals, so as far as I know. Um, or if we did, it would only be with the London dry style ones and it would be sort of like a, a sourcing thing, but um, I dig them both. I'm, I'm happy. I like I like this one because it has it has something for the new school and, and Sif Smith is definitely one of the best versions of the old school. Yeah, no, I like this. It's subtle, it's mellow. You know, I find a lot of gins tend to be a little more harsh not all gins, but a decent amount are a little more harsh, but this is not, I like that. It's, you know, it's more of your everyday kind of sipping gin versus a cocktailing gin, which I find a lot of gins are designed and distilled to cocktail with, whereas this really feels like it'd be a connected like sip and really appreciate and really, you know, enjoy a nice glass of at room temperature for a couple hours. Uh God bless you if you're if you're the type to drink warm gin. I, I like to put this on the rocks. I mean, I think it's because it's that I think what for to kind of translate what you just said to how I think about it, I think it's about that balance um, of those different sort of distillates and, and botanicals. So if you have like I don't I, I will use beef eater tank rate Bombay and a cocktail all day, but if you put them on the rocks, those things, those distillates kind of hold together pretty well. And it's because they all have a pretty strong balance and foundation. Um, and to me, when you get like sort of like a cocktail gin these days, it's it's a lot of different um, companies and spirits competing for like loud flavors, and you know, and trying to kind of stand out from the crowd as opposed to making the highest quality product um, that they can. Um, you know, not not naming anybody in particular, but if you can if you can achieve that balance, I think it's exactly what you're kind of saying. It, it allows you to kind of take your time with something, just put it on the rocks. You don't have to try and figure out uh, an application because it's got three times the amount of lavender as the gin next to it or something like that. Um, I don't know, that's, that's, no, that's I how I, I, 
No, yeah, that, that, that no, was please, Lord, that's, that's, how, that's how I kind of, uh, <laughs> I, I, I tend to think about it, you know, just put it on the rocks and if it's a good spirit, it should have some pretty good legs in the glass. Sure. Uh, no, I'm definitely the kind of person who enjoys his gin, warm, room temperature, neat, just in the time. Hardcore. <laughs> right on, man. I'm, I'm not going to lie. That's, I don't that's know if I would say hardcore. It's just, you know, I want to be oh, able maybe. to get the most flavor out of it. And I find that if I chill a spirit, it locks it down and I lose flavor. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a fun thing to do with the, this gin as well is do the same thing that we do with our spirits. Add a little bit of water. It is that blend of distillate, so it is going to kind of develop in the glass and evolve over time. Okay. So even it, it, and maybe that's um, one of those things where uh, I don't know. It's 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 as I said, everything from Centauri is a blend, and and everything's meant to have this um, these layers of different flavor. So for me, it's a it's I just a added a splash of soda water to it. What soda are you having? Oh, we were, yeah. We were talking about soda Cocoa. earlier. Oh, right on. We were talking about soda earlier. We were talking about the Centauri Toki highball machines before uh, we started recording. And I remember telling you a couple of weeks ago how they are my favorite soda water in the world, other than Topo Chico. But, you know, there's so few and far between in L.A. that it's really hard to get them. Really hard to get, you know, a hold of that water. And that's like, that water is good yeah it's it's a it's addictive to the point of being in pain i wish la was just not quite so big and i mean we're doing god's work we're trying to we're trying to sell them into more places um we're trying to get them into, into more venues and things like that um we'll see uh i'm i think we're all curious to see what the next step of of opening is because they're a number of, they're, they've just been kind of sitting um in sadness and disuse for the last kind of last year so yeah, I'm excited to have my first highball in person in, in the very near future. I'm excited too, and you know, hopefully, when things go back to some sense of normalcy, maybe we can bring one into the Daily Pint. Yeah, man, I, I haven't been to the Daily Pint in a minute. I think I, last time I was there, I was playing. He knows where I worked before COVID, Chris right? Amara. No, I thought you worked at the was it the Double Barrel. Did I, I get that wrong? There in over a year. All right. Well, I'm not wrong, <laughs> but you did work there at some point, right? <laughs> I did. I started the. I helped yeah. start the bar there. I was one of the first hires. Right on. So you're and you're currently at the Daily Pine. Is that what you're saying, or was that also in a previous life? Uh, that was pre-COVID. Pre-COVID. Yeah. What's the Daily name Pine of the? Won't reopen the until Phil McGovern. Yeah, he's wait, he's British, right? He's 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 a gas. Yep. I love him. <laughs> he's a good guy. Cool character. Um, I like him a lot. I and I also just like I like bars where there's just shit everywhere. And 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 when I say shit there, I mean like beautiful, expensive bottles of every kind of whiskey imaginable. So like I love dive bars oh, yeah. that have just years of memory all over the walls and tiki bars that have everything all I I don't know. I it's one of my favorite parts about going out to a bar. Someone puts some thought into it, or you know, old absent house where it's just business cards and dollar bills. <laughs> Look, you know, the Daily Pint. It does have. It's got memorabilia and like you know, beer signs everywhere. Um, but that's kind of part of its charm. Yeah, and great beer too. Great beer. Oh my God, some of the best beer in the city. Um, awesome. Let's move on to the Toki now. Yeah, let's do it. Now, you Toki a gets to a lot of shit. Why does Toki get Why? so much what? shit? Why do people hate on Toki? I don't know. You tell me, man. That that's. I don't know, dude. Why I, don't, would you, I have what? no problem with the flavor of people. Don't like the flavor. They're like Toki's terrible. I'm like, but it's not. I think it, I. So I don't understand. I never hated on Toki. I always enjoyed it. Um, I that I don't that, think I've ever hated on Toki. That's odd to me. The only thing I can think is that maybe maybe people are bringing some preconceptions to the to the taste to the flavor of Toki, which is that 
to me, it is a very reasonable, very affordable, very real Japanese whiskey that is a great oh. introduction to the category as well. Um, and I guess it's, oh, to me, I mean, oh, go. what did I say? Real Japanese whiskey. Well, yeah. I, you know, just want to insert some um, facts into the conversation, but it's... So I guess we're going to get into that then. So finish about what you well, were saying then. Let, Let's let, let's dive let, into that. Let's let's have a well. Let's have a let's have another couple of glasses. Let me and, and until we get into that because it'll be more fun if we do. But um, the Toki to me <laughs> is I, I feel like it's because if you look at Toki, if you look at any of our whiskeys, um, Toki is lighter in terms of color, but that's all mm -hmm. natural. There is no caramel added. Um, walk into a liquor store and pick up a bottle of blended Scotch. It looks like bourbon nine times out of 10. And that's because there is so much caramel added to it. And that's to kind of trick your eyes and make you think that it's usually a lot uh, older than it is. Toki has over 50% malt whiskey in the blend. Tell me, a, tell me a blended whiskey that's not made by Compass Box that has over 50% malt, single malt whiskey in the blend. Um, and it's, and it's, to me, it's just a great uh... representation of that I mean, almost any IB blended malt or literally any blended malt scotch whiskey because blended malt is just single malt from two different distilleries. Right, but tell me a blended whiskey. A blended whiskey, one that includes grain whiskey that has okay, more than 50%. I don't have an answer for you then. Yeah, I don't have an well, answer I for you then. The, the only ones that you're going to get are going to be either some some boutique bottlers. It's it's. If you find some, let me know um, because I'd love oh. to try them. The average, the average blended whiskey is like what, 25, 20, 30 percent single malt in the blend. I mean, they never disclose I'm that, not but that's honestly kind of sure. That's something I'd actually like to learn. You know, Kentucky and Scotland are on my docket to hit in the next year and a half ish. And I mean, like, 365 days, not calendar year, because who knows what's going to happen in the rest of 2021. Um, everyone was making jokes as the New Year struck up, oh, it's 2021! And it's like, okay, yeah, you're super funny, now sit down. Um, back on the Toki, though, talking about light, it's also a more light whiskey. You know, and I mean light more in terms of delicate, not light whiskey, as in like, you know, the category of light whiskey. Now, can you tell us, or rather, I know you can, so would you please talk to us a little bit about the blend that goes into making Toki, the components of it, because it is not what people think, like, at all. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it's just, it's made in a completely different way from your average blended whiskey. So your typical blended whiskey is kind of made like a triangle. It's called the blender's triangle. They also use it in the perfume industry where you have a bunch of old whiskeys at the top. Um, those are your single malts, your sherry casks, things like that. You have a few in the middle and then you have a whole shit ton of grain whiskey at the bottom to kind of stretch those flavors out and soften them up. Now, Toki is, was built from the ground up to be used in cocktails and, and highballs. So, and we also control the entire process. We own all of the, dis all of the distilleries that make the distillate that go into Toki. Um, each one of those makes multiple different kinds of whiskey at each one of those distilleries. So we have a lot of different things that we can do and we can plan um, the whole process start to finish, right? We're not sourcing anything. So with the, the grain whiskey, we are able to make a really big full body grain whiskey. Um, and we also make ours from corn. Um, most blended whiskeys are made from wheat. It's the difference in commodity prices between Europe and Japan. Um, and then we also have an absolute shit ton, like a huge amount of single malt from Hakushu. But most people kind of think of Hakushu as being like the smoky type that we're going to try in a second. But there's I love Hakushu. literally dozens. Well, like which type? Because there's literally dozens of different types of Hakushu distillates. The Peter 12. And yeah, me too. Uh, you know, and and that's the one that most people are familiar with. But Suntory, we make more Hakushu than just that. And there's multiple different types of Hakushu that goes into that 12. 
So we had this really citrusy, floral, grassy Hakushu distillate that was going into other blends that was very delicate and soft. So that's the beauty of Toki. It's the balance of that full-bodied grain whiskey, the cheetah heavy, and the Hakushu lightly peated. Um, and that gets you about 90%, uh, give or take, It's 90% isn't a real number, it's a conceptual one. But the rest of that, where we add in some Yamazaki Spanish oak, um, which is very similar to the sherry cask. Uh, and that gives it that sort of like those ginger notes, those baking spice notes, but it's it's a delicate whiskey, but it's by design. It's so that you can get those citrusy floral notes, the kind of things that kind of really, one, um, are kind of symbolic of the aromatics of Japanese whiskey in general. Um, and two, work really well in cocktails and highballs. You know, it's not malt forward. It's not cereal forward like a scotch. That's that style of making malt whiskey. It's more aromatic. It's more estuary. It's more citrusy. It's more floral, which is very much more aligned to all Japanese whiskeys across the board and how they're made. So that's that's a nerdy answer. But um, <laughs> I don't know, man. I, I think people are just coming with this idea that it's going to be this big, chewy, malty, cereal forward kind of um, whiskey. But it's actually this light, delicate, floral, citrusy one. And if you embrace that, it's 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 a great example. Now, I recently joined you for a component tasting and a deconstruction of Toki. And in that component tasting, there was a whiskey that was the equivalent of one that, of a whiskey from uh, Suntory that had won, you know, like world's best whiskey or something. It was like the Hibiki Sherry Cask or something. Uh, the Spanish Oak. Yeah. Yeah, or cousins to, to Sherry Cask. Yeah. Um, you want me to go into so, that? I'll, I'll talk all day about that. Please. It's a, it's a yeah, no, whiskey. please. Like, that's what I was asking you to do. Like, I want you to dive into that part of the component. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the majority of, of what goes into Toki, um, as I said, is single malt, um, which is incredibly unique and rare for a blended whiskey. Um, and added to that sort of Hakushu lightly peated notes, um, which are citrusy, floral, grassy, you have this Spanish oak cask, which um, we do something really unique with, at Centauri with our Spanish oak and sherry cask, which is that we directly make the casks um, or we directly commission them from Spain. So we actually send people out into the forest to select the trees. Um, we closely monitor how they're cut into planks and then staves and we season them for extensive a long periods of time, like six years, um, three years just now, not sitting out and then you. three years with wine. Yeah. Real quick, when you say season, what does that mean for Suntory? Because maker seasons outdoors, you know, letting it get weather, you know, other distilleries seasoning their way. They got a, a freeze. Um, it's it's what you think the sort of the the typical way, which is cutting them into planks and letting them sit out in a a parking lot looking type place, an outdoor storage area where they get rained on, they get the sun on them, they get the wind, they get the elements, and the tannins leach out onto the ground, looks like a rust stain, it's that. But we do it for longer than most people actually do it. Most people do it for a year or so, maybe 18 months. We do it for up to three years. So we really, wow. really want those tan those tannins softened and we want the, the spirit that goes into that to, to have a, a soft and delicate structure because um, it's gonna be a first fill cask. Um, that's, the, that's kind of the difference. Um, most, most places are going to char that if they're bourbon barrels or something like that. Um, and then those are going to go on to continue to be reused after bourbon in the scotch industry. But those are, you know, refill or ex bourbon casks. Um, when, you know, the Spanish oak has a lot of tannins. It's a high tannin species. So anything that you can do to, to mitigate that or soften it in a way, it gives you a much more, um, subtle, uh, whiskey. And that was a big reason why that sherry cask was so famous off the price explosion of Japanese whiskeys a few years ago. There was a lot of effort and time and quality control uh, on over the course of like 18, 23 years. You know, the person who, who selected that tree in a forest in Northern Spain 
probably never got to taste the whiskey, which is um, sad and amazing all at the same time, you know, because there's like 18, going, 23 year gap. Going back real quick, just so I understand you correctly, you're saying that these staves are brand new, never used until uh, once they're seasoned, of course, that is, then they're used for the first time, right? So it's like one and done. So it's basically a virgin oak and then you send it off to somewhere else. So you, you want to be specific. I'll be extra specific. So cut the tree down, turn it into staves. Staves sit out for three years. All right. Weathering, seasoning, however you want to describe that. Cut the planks into staves, turn it into a barrel. Season with wine for an additional three years. Empty the gotcha. casks. Yeah. Break down the barrels for shipping purposes. Ship to Japan. Whiskey goes into barrel. So the as a barrel, it's never held a spirit product before. It's a first fill Spanish oak sherry cask, but that doesn't mean that it didn't hold wine. Does that make sense? Gotcha. It does, and it actually answers another question that I ask brands on the regular is, and I think I even asked you, you know, last time we chatted, are these actual sherry casks or, you know, Spanish wine casks rather, or are they casks that held it just long enough to impart flavor to then send it to Scotland or Kentucky or whatever to then give it for finishing? And you answered that question of, no, they're pretty much real Spanish wine casks or Spanish sherry oak casks. Yeah, the, the only reason why the Spanish oak isn't um, called a sherry cask is because there's a very well-known region in, called Montilla, which provides a lot of the grapes for the sherry region. Um, as do long as you? a lot of like the... I hope not. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Jonathan? I'm here. Are you here? There we are. Welcome back. Okay. We just had a hiccup. We had a brief hiccup for a moment. It happens. Okay. Yeah. The, um, what I was saying was that the, the difference between the Spanish oak and the sherry cast is just because those Spanish oak casts, um, there's one producer that we use in Montilla. That's not technically part of the sherry triangle. Um, and they make exceptional quality casks. So that's why we choose to use them. Um, but to be, you know, completely honest and transparent and technical, they're not technically part of the sherry industry. So that's why we say Spanish oak as opposed to gotcha. um, sherry cask. You know, I still have to look into it of why we have California sherry, but like that, if you know sherry, which you do, but I don't think a lot of the viewers do. Like you were saying, sherry has to come from the specific region of Spain, the Sherry Triangle. Typically, you know, you think of sherry, you think of Jerez de la Frontera, but there's actually a couple other towns, you know, inside of that triangle that can make sherry. Um, if you're interested in sherry, by the way, guys, I highly recommend going to Lustau's website, the House of Lustau, uh, L-U-S-T-A-U. Yeah, L-U-S-T-A-U. They have some great educational information on Sherry, and it covers more than just Lustau. It's not, it is sponsored by Lustau, of course. Um, the program that I took was the Certified Sherry Wine Specialist, the CSWS. Um, fantastic course, and it's sponsored by Lustau, but it's also with the Sherry Regulatory Council, the CRS, basically. Consejo Regulador de Sherry, or whatever Sherry is technically in like Spanish. I know the CRT is Consejo Regulador de Tequila. Um, anyway, so that goes into that question. Thank you. I really appreciate that answer. You know, it's nice that we were able to get down and nerdy and gritty into that. You know, it's something that I love. And I think it really helps to educate the end drinker. So that they can then go to their friends like, hey, you know, guess what I found out? Yeah, I heard, you know, the Beam Suntory brand ambassador, you know, the, the Habiki brand ambassador. He was talking about this from, you know, their wood and it's so cool and this and this and this. And it, it just, I love it. 
And I find that the people who want to watch this kind of stuff also love it. So again, thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. I mean, that's the, that's some of my favorite parts about getting um, into these conversations where it's um, nothing. It's not that anything's better or worse than everything. It, like more often than not, things are just different. Um, and you know, we're not the only people doing first fill sherry casts, and we're not the only people who have uh, who directly commission casts from Spain. But it's I don't know. It's spirits are very complicated, and as much as you can celebrate the effort that kind of goes into them, um, and the hand of the maker, the terroir, when you get into the different parts of these different things, you know, I I, I feel like a lot of times in spirits, we don't get to celebrate all these fun facts and details the way that wine nerds do. You know what I mean? People and yeah. and they almost they fed they fetishize them, um, and people fetishize the amount of knowledge that wine nerds have. But when it comes to spirits, it's just is it expensive or not, or what kind of branding is behind it? When there's so much more detail and cool things going on behind the scenes. I agree. And you know, the behind the scenes leads into some of the most fun conversations and nerdy, you know, discussions. And that is why, you know, I really enjoy going to a distillery tour because when you're there, almost nothing's off limits. You can see the production. You can see like, oh, well, you're running your skill. What are you running it to? And oh, you're doing this. And what do you, how long do you run it for? And what do you take your cuts for? And sometimes even the best ambassador on the ground doesn't know this. People, no one's asked them that. So they've never found it out. And it's nothing against them. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I'll, it, there's a lot of different ways to tell a story. You can do it with all the nerdy, fun, scientific effects. You can, or you can talk about how, um, where, where the spirit comes from, the natural resources, the water, th things like that, who it's made by. Are they like first, second, third, fourth, fifth generation? Um, there's many way, <laughs> more than one way to, uh, to skin a cat, as they say. <laughs> Very true. Um, let's come over to the harmony now. So, Hibiki, Japanese harmony. Uh, first and foremost, there's a meaning to the, whatever you want to call them, on the bottle. Can you explain that? The, the kanji? Uh, those kanji no. calligraphy? So, yeah. So. No, not the kanji. Oh, uh, no. Please explain that, too. But I'm talking about the actual bottle design, the shape. He's like, divot, oh, for lack yeah. of a better term. Sure. The, the facets. Yeah. So similarly to that beautiful bottle of Roku that has six sides, um, Hibiki has 24 sides because there are 24 seasons in the traditional Japanese lunar calendar. Um, and that kind of goes back to that idea of Shun that we were talking about before. Um, but it's, it's really just a kind of homage. So there are a lot of, on each one of our different bottles, there are a lot of little details that most people wouldn't sort of recognize wh whether or not it's, the kanji and the significance. So toki meet that kanji, that means time in Japanese. Um, hibiki, that kanji means um, sort of like harmony and and resonance. Um, and that's sort of invoking this idea of balance in the in the wood. Um, and then and then Yamazaki and Hakushu have different meanings as well. But the the bottle itself is meant to sort of um, represent those 24 facets of the Japanese calendar, because when this spirit was initially launched in 1989, it was for the 90th anniversary of the company. Um, and the charge to the blender at that time, who was, I believe it was Koichi Inatome, um, who was uh, Koshimizu's successor, was done by Keizo Saji, the son of the founder, to create a blend that exemplified Japanese whiskey. So he wanted to incorporate as many different elements. He wanted to incorporate Mizunara of wood. Um, the the label on that Hibiki is sort of drawn on that kanji symbol. Um, and with the name, that's actually called Echizen Washi, which is very traditional style of Japanese paper as well. So there's all these different little elements on the, even on the outer packaging um, where we kind of try and build in meaning and significance, um, which is pretty cool. And then there's the liquid. There's the actual whiskey inside of it. Um, which has its own unique blend and sort of philosophy as well. By all means, please take it away. Tell us what the unique blend and philosophy. That's what we're here for, man. Oh yeah, man. Uh, well, I was just I was I was talking for a long time. I thought I'd 
uh, take a break and breathe. Um, it was <laughs> so that philosophy behind uh, was essentially what I just said, which was to invoke um, the Japanese whiskey industry uh, and or category as a whole. So in addition to having um, single malts and this, and to be perfectly honest, this whiskey is, more, is constructed more in that classic blenders triangle. Um, there's also no caramel coloring added to it. All the color comes from those key malts, those aromatic malts. Um, so for us, you know, the reason why we have, this has, um, this ha has some cherry cask in it as well. This has Mizunara cask, which are the, uh, the key malts for this blend. Um, the reason why we wanted to incorporate that, the reason why we go through all the trouble with those sherry casts, to be perfectly honest, be is because um, that is almost even more significant to the House of Centauri than the Mizunara. Uh, you know, Mizunara these days gets a lot of PR and a lot of press, and rightfully so. It's an incredible sort of style of wooden distillate um, that we make, and we'll get into it in a second. But the very first whiskey that Centauri ever made in 1929 most likely went into sherry casks because that was um, that product that we you can kind of see if you look it up online akadama port wine or akadama sweet wine would have been sherries that our founder shinjiro tori imported from japan it became his first real successful product so what he did is he um he had all these barrels lying around the first whiskeys would have gone into that so for almost a hundred years um and in about six or seven more years, we'll have been using sherry casks, and it's been a huge part of every single blend that we've ever made. So that went into the Hibiki, and that's also a big reason why we spend all that time on the casks themselves, uh, making sure that there's quality in the process. On top of that, we also have that Musanara cask, um, which we were actually the first people to ever use Musanara, Centauri Company was, because after World War II, you know, there wasn't a lot going on in Japan in terms of importing whiskey barrels from abroad. So we had to kind of fend for ourselves. Um, and that involved using domestic styles of wood, finding those varieties that actually worked. And, exper and experimenting with Mizunara, we found that had a really unique flavor profile. It's an absolutely terrible vessel. It's, it, <laughs> it's quite a hot vessel in the world for holding liquid. Um, but, and it's expensive and it's rare, uh, and it's hard to make and, and work from like a Cooper's perspective, but we, we put up with all these different parts, these processes, because it has such a unique flavor, which is like this flavor. It's got more lactones, which is like coconut vanilla note than even bourbon than American white oak, which is unheard of, but it's also got all the spiciness of the sherry cask and the Spanish oak. And it's like, they had a beautiful, beautiful baby. It's incredible. And then it's got all these like sandalwood and aloe and, and Japanese temple and cedar kind of notes to it, incense. Um, and it just really gives the, the whiskey this really delicate, unique flavor profile and really kind of extends the finish as well. Um, and just complex. On the note of Mizunara. Describe that whiskey. Um, yeah. Whiskey fact time, you guys. I probably should have put that all in one to be with the hashtag, but whatever, we get the idea. Uh, Mizunara, everyone's familiar with Quercus Rober and Quercus uh, Petrea? God, now I'm blanking on it. Yeah, those are the two um, Europeans. Quercus Rober, Quercus Petrea. And what's the American one again? I'm blanking on it Quercus right now. Alba. Thank you. Jesus, Quercus, Quercus Alba. Yep. Um, and also Gariana. Now these days, too. Gary well, I'm not getting into Gariana. That's a whole <laughs> other ball game. I haven't researched it enough. Uh, but I have researched Mizunara. So Mizunara Oak, the Latin technical name, is Quercus mongolica, and the subspecies is Crispula. Technically speaking, it's actually a Mongolian oak, and it bends, like he was saying, it's really hard to work with because it's really porous. And it's also really hard to cooper because it bends and twists and knots because it oftentimes is growing on the sides of mountains where there's obviously a heavy wind factor. So it's going to grow to, you know, kind of subvert the wind. So when you're building Mizunara staves, you got to be really careful to avoid those knots. Otherwise, you'll probably have the really bad, you know, a not so great built stave. Um, in addition, oftentimes people find that Mizunara 
imparts like a pineapple. Seek that flavor note out. Uh, and that is my quick whiskey fact on Mizunara. So, I have my fun, and it is back to you, Mr. Armstrong. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, we were just hanging out talking about Hibiki, um, giving it a little you bit of a taste. You want to move from the Harmony over to the 17, which you kindly provided me a sample of. I did. There's my, my beautiful, beautiful handwriting. Um, better than mine. Yeah. The, I'll tell you that. Uh, yeah, the 17... Uh, hold that near and dear because that's um, very hard to find these days. Um, unfortunately, it's just to me. It's it's. I think it's actually probably my favorite of of all the whiskeys uh, in Suntory. It's definitely the first one I fell in love with. Um, and it's it's really when it's a whiskey that I've never heard anybody give any flack for being a blend. You know, there's a lot of. Uh, uh, just chef, chest puffing out when it comes to single malts versus blended whiskeys. Everybody likes Hibiki 17. I don't, I've, I've never heard anybody taste that whiskey and it's like, well, it's no single malt. Said no one ever. Um, it's just a beautiful, beautiful blend. And to me, it's where you really, where those, those, that aromatic citrusy floral note that you get with Japanese whiskeys and a Hibiki Harmony, it really starts to kind of find a balance with the extraction from the wood. And you get like this this great balance of like uh, like grapefruit custard and vanilla and sweetness and, and from the barrel, but also with the fruitiness from the the spirit. And it's just it's just nummy num num all day long. Um, I can <laughs> nummy num num. I, can I quote you on that? Please do. Said <laughs> Centauri West Coast brand ambassador John Armstrong. Um, and and I like I personally like it uh, a little bit more than the twenty one. That might be heresy because you know the twenty one one. Um, at this point, a lot more awards, but it's 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 really decadent too, um, and really I mean, full-bodied. For me personally, is... I don't give a shit about awards. Well, you know, you know, it, people they're great; they have their place in time. But I don't give a shit about them. You know, I don't look to a whiskey and be like, "Oh, hey, that one double gold. Let's buy it." I'm like, "Okay, one sure. double gold." And who cares? And it, and it really doesn't really Good matter. For you. I'm happy for Japanese you, but whiskey. like. I'm just being a cynic. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Like I, I, I would. I think I'd probably more kind of like fall into that into that camp more, except for two points. Um, and I'll, I'll just, I'm just kind of being the devil's advocate on on the opposite side here. Like I, I'm not actively reading the World Whiskey Awards or anything like that, but these days. But you know, in the past, when not a lot of people knew about Japanese whiskeys. Those were those awards were very important historically because they kind of um, showed that Japanese whiskey was arriving and was presenting the same amount of the same level of quality uh, on the world stage. Um, and historically, they had great influence over you know getting these whiskeys into markets that uh, or portfolios that uh, weren't familiar with the category. And then the other one is that the the producers, the makers, the chief blenders, the distillers, and things like that, you know. It is, it is one of the few times where they actually get uh, to sit at a dinner and be um, sort of lauded and, and given the credit that they deserve, so. Sorry, I'm lost in thought after tasting this whiskey. That's, that's it, quite all right, man, that's a good thing. It's something spectacular. It's, yeah. <laughs> I, I wish we had more of it to go around. So for anybody who's watching, um, save what you have. And also check out the, that label. I, get, oh, I, I, I gave you a sample. So uh, this is when those little details in the bottles, they change from expression to expression. This is when the, the machine-made um, washi on the Hibiki Harmony changes to a handmade. Let me see it again. Oops. Change, changes to a handmade washing. Yeah. Beautiful. Which is, it, you know, it's little little things like that um, that they really they really get right at, at Suntory. 
So let's jump over now um, to the Yama 12 year. Um, and also, just a quick note, you guys, a big thank you to Mr. John Armstrong for providing us the samples and the Haku and Roku. The Toki and Hibiki, actually, I happen to have on hand already. And if you jump back in my channel to November, I did a video talking about the Suntory Toki and tasting it neat, and then made a Toki highball in December. So I will actually drop those in the description down below later this evening. Uh, so you guys can go back and watch those. So where are we at here? We're at we're going into the twelve year? Yama twelve. Yamazaki right, so twelve this, year. Yamazaki twelve was the first commercially successful single malt in Japan. It was not the first single malt, um, but it was the first one that really kind of broke through and became famous. And we launched it in 1984 um, to commemorate the 60th anniversary of the Yamazaki Distillery. Uh, and when it actually launched, fun fact, fun whiskey fact for your viewers, is that it didn't have an age statement. Um, it did not say 12 years on this. It said pure Hang malt. on, hang on, hang on. Uh, whiskey fact time. Whiskey facts. Um, so, and then a few years later, they decided to throw the 12 on there because it, it sort of easily, um, met those requirements. And, you know, actually a huge portion of the whiskey that goes into these 12 year olds, um, is actually much, much, much older. Um, those, uh, those component whiskeys. So this is probably a great time to talk about, um, and reiterate how everything from Suntory is a blend of some form. Um, so even in our single malt whiskeys, Yamazaki, this is a blend of different distillates. You know, we have the Yamazaki sherry cask going in there. We have the Mizunara cask. We have the white oak punchin. We have variation on those where we have new um, virgin oak casks. And we have uh, refill casks. Um, you know, there's, you know, half a dozen or more different distillates and types of whiskey that go into this bottle. And it's not just, you know, finishes in the barrel. So that. That's really kind of thing that kind of separates uh, Japanese whiskey and Centauri as the largest house from Scotch, where in Scotland, you have, you know, over 100 distilleries and each of them more or less makes one thing, um, tripping off the stills I made. You know, they have different age statements, they have different cast finishes and things like that. A few of them have different length fermentations. But at Centauri, we practice this art called Sukuriwake, which is called diversity in the making. So at every step in the process of making a whiskey, we make it multiple different ways. So, and that's just bizarre because it's the opposite of efficiency and what they do in <laughs> in Scotland. So, you know, we don't just use one type of yeast, we use both brewers and distillers yeast. Um, we don't just use uh, wooden washbacks, we have stainless steel and wood. Um, and if you, if you ever go to our websites and you look at our still rooms, you'll see in the still rooms that it's um, stills of every shape and size you can possibly imagine, like big, small, onion, lantern shape with different condenser arms going up, down, left, sideways, you name it. And they can all be mixed and matched so that we can create all so, these different flavors. Speaking of your website, Suntory now offers virtual tours uh, through the website, virtual distillery tours, yeah? Uh, I believe so. I haven't... They, I haven't been on one. I should probably check that out. I, I hope that it's, uh, I hope it lasts forever so that I can get a chance to, to do this. Um, I think it, maybe that's, uh, something that's existed because, uh, there's a huge, huge, uh, tourist, tourism industry in Japan around our distilleries, like over a hundred thousand people visit each one of our distilleries, um, each year. And that's really impressive when it comes to Yamazaki, but it's even more impressive when it comes to Hakushu because that's, way out there. It's like two and a half hours west, uh, northwest of um, Tokyo on the Shinkansen, the bullet train. So it's it's wow. a bit remote. Just a bit. You know, actually, I meant to talk to you about that and see if you wanted to do that in a totally space. But you know what? It worked out, I think, better. Because we're going through nine different uh, whiskeys here tonight. Um, yeah, which what are we on now? We are Five? starting to... 
we are about to go to the Yamazaki 18 year actually. Um, but before we jump over to the Yamazaki 18 year, you talked about Scotland and Scotch, and that's something I wanted to touch upon. You know, you mentioned it earlier, is the new rules from the Japanese uh, Spirits and Liqueur Makers Association. Obviously, you know, well, not obviously, but a lot of people don't realize that. I didn't realize it at first. The JLSMA, whatever you, however, whatever acronym. JSLMA. Um, <laughs> JSMLA. Uh, quick question actually from John McGillwain. He said he sought the Yamazaki 12 with a single malt and not a blend. John's a great question. It is because I, I just muddied the waters by saying that, but we're both right. Um, it is a single malt and it is a blend. It is a blend of distillates. So, uh, and this is important to get right because um, this is a big difference between Japanese whiskey and scotch. Uh, every pretty much every distillery in japan makes multiple different types of things and that's because in japan we don't trade stock behind mm -hmm. the scenes um in scotland there's a big industry of trading stock and barrels between distilleries and that's how they make their blended whiskeys in japan fierce 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 corporate rivalry um driving everything that they do um so they do not sell each other whiskey in order to make blends, the distilleries have to make multiple different types of whiskey. Now, Yamazaki is a single malt because all of those whiskeys come from Yamazaki. All of them are malted whiskeys that are distilled in a pot still, but they are de they are definitely different things. They are like a big body distilled, a small body distilled, a small bodied in a sherry cask, a, a big bodied in a misanara cask. That's how they create those blends. But the definition of a single malt is whiskey that comes from a, a single distillery uh, made from malted barley and distilled in a pot still. And for that reason, uh, we definitely qualify. And, and I would say that it's our big contribution to the single malt sort of category. And it's something that we're kind of actually seeing more and more Scotch whiskey producers trying to do and mimic where they're doing lots of different parallel aging. They're running their fermentations at different times. They're doing mashings in different ways um, to try and create those different flavors, even within their own distilleries. None of them, I, th I think, in my personal opinion, are anywhere near um, what's going on at like Suntory or some of the other Japanese distilleries. And that's because we've just been doing it for four, 40 years at this point. So we have a lot of experience in terms of creating those, um, those liquid streams from scratch. It's a great, great, great question. A really important one too. A huge question, a hugely important question and a great distinction, because until he, you know, he brought that up and I was focused on moving us along, I wouldn't have caught that. But same thing in my head. I thought that you said that Yamazaki, like Hibiki, like Toki, was a blend where it came from the other distilleries that are owned by Suntory, not all from the Yamazaki distillery. So I appreciate you clarifying that uh, for John and for myself. Anytime, man. That's, what, that's, that's, that's why we do this, right? Um, but what's so next? You're talking you talking about Scotch, the JSMLA. Ah. Um, I already butchered it. JSLMA? Whatever. The new, no, the recently, uh, JSLMA, thank you. Recently announced um, some regulations that they plan to impose for their members on Japanese whiskey. One of which being that you cannot import whiskey from other countries, mostly, most notably Scotland, bottle it in Japan, and then sell it as Japanese whiskey, either locally or domestically or internationally, like in markets such as America or Europe, leading to other brands who are also members like, okay, we respect that decision, and we will change our packaging accordingly. Um, mm -hmm. Now, that also brought up rice distillate that i'll get to in a second but uh the question is you know first of all obviously we've talked about it and you're telling us that nothing in any of these whiskeys is coming from anywhere but japan so that doesn't affect you guys how badly do you think or greatly how do you think it will affect the japanese whiskey industry of certain producers no longer being able to just buy bulk product and then bottle it and sell it as Japanese. 
So, man, that's a that's a tough question because um, the truthful answer is is I just don't know. Um, but I can speculate. Uh, Please, you know, here with you guys w within the bounds of good taste. Um, so what I, th I the biggest effect is the one that's already happening, right? Which is that, and it's been a really fun thing to um, have my job for the last month or two because for the longest time, um, I we've really been encouraged not to talk about this from Centauri because we didn't want to be seen as um, imposing our will on small craft producers or things like that. You know, I mean, the, a lot of the companies we're talking about are not the the big three whiskey producers, which are Centauri, Nika, and Kieran. So we really didn't want to be seen as kind of being a bully in any way, shape, or form. But we were are definitely allowed to talk about our own products, which is, and to that end, every single one of the things that um, your viewers try from us was, is real Japanese whiskey in the strictest, that it was fermented or mashed, fermented, distilled, aged, and bottled entirely in Japan, right? So nothing was um, ever imported uh, and blended into the whiskey from another country. Now that's unique in Japan because, uh, but it's not in the rest of the world because, you know, of the five major whiskey producing regions in the world, which are Scotland, the United States, Japan, Ireland, and Canada, um, the only one that doesn't require that by law um, is Japan. Um, all those other countries, they're all aligned. You have to do every part of the step in that country for it to be called that whiskey. So, uh, and that's, it, it's just been an unfortunate um, thing with Japan that it's gotten so far and so long that it's allowed people to take advantage of it. You know, it wasn't really a big deal back in the day um, when people were importing it and putting it into cheap supermarket blends that were sold in like big liter jugs. You know, if you're spending $10 for a liter and a half of whiskey, you probably are, are buying it for a different reason than say the person who's spending $100 on a 700 milliliter bottle. You know what I mean? Those are two entirely yeah. different consumers. And it's it's important to really realize that process and uh, it, that distinction. What's going on now and what has been happening is that people have been shipping whiskey to Japan in huge quantities because of the new popularity of Japanese whiskey, dumping the barrels if they're even shipped in barrels, putting it into bottles, putting new labels on them that didn't that never existed before, and shipping it to the United States or Europe and and creating brands out of thin air, and and you know, charging several hundred dollars for an eighteen year old whiskey that's not from Japan and in any real meaningful sense. Um, so that's 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 kind of the issue and the problem. The, bet, the good thing about these new regulations is that it's shining a light on that. There's a lot of new articles. Um, this is like the third or the fourth time in a couple of weeks that I've got to answer this question, which makes me really happy because we've known that this has been going on for years now um, and that there is this distinction between these people who are doing it the right way and these people who are trying to make a buck. So um, that being said, the JSLMA that you're talking about is a members only. It is, it, the, the extent of its authority is toward its members. It's not, uh, it's not a legal authority by um, the Japanese government per se. It doesn't have, it can't force people to comply. Um, that's for the tax laws to be perfectly honest and they're it's still extremely lax. And then on top of that, there's also like a four or five year grace period, I believe for these new regulations. So even the members um, who are a part of them, you know, they have lots of product out in the market. It's gonna be some time before there's some sort of truth in advertising when it comes to the labels on the bottle. Um, the interesting question is what happens moving forward. So Suntory, we're very, again, we're very fortunate. We haven't had to change any of our, our wording and our advertising. We've been very transparent and we have for a very long time. Um, some of our competitors who we agreed not to name names here, but people can do their own research. If you go to their websites, no they've changed name. some, no names name. Uh, you can go to their websites and some of them are doing the right thing and being transparent on specific bottlings which is good, right? Because that shows you, if you really believe that all that matters is what goes into the bottle, then let's be transparent about that, right? And let's and let's talk about what goes Absolutely. into the bottle. Uh, um, and then there are some people who are just gonna probably for the next four or five years, uh, do whatever they have to, to continue to make money. And it's gonna be up to the consumers to kind of um, distinguish them. But I'm, I'm really excited that we have to have the conversation and the, and the pressure on doing things the right way 
is building in a positive direction. Agreed, absolutely. Um, another thing that they mentioned in the JSLMA new rules is that Japanese whiskey has to be made with malted barley, or malted, not malted barley, but malted grain, they said. Um, yeah. Which would theoretically rule out rice-based whiskey distillates. Um, I personally and professionally, it's a well-known fact, do not consider rice-based distillate to be whiskey. I consider it a high-proof barrel-aged shochu. Um, my thoughts on that are if it's not whiskey in its country of distillation and origin, why should I consider it whiskey? Why should it be whiskey here? Yeah, um, it's it's. I don't know if that, that was a question, but I definitely uh, can agree with portions of that statement. Um, there, there's this other part about it, which that that itself in the if I can catch up with my words here, um, that portion of the new <laughs> regulations is also a little bit um, ambiguous right now. And, I, and I'm I'm actually hoping to do a, a seminar at Tails. I have a proposal in um, with. Uh, Mamaru Suchia, um, if I can get in contact with him to do to, and a lot also with Liam McNulty, who runs no communication, um, dot JP. These are some guys who have been really, Absolutely. um, great assets in sharing information about the process of ma making these new regulations and, and also like really help to for your viewers, if they want to read some professional opinions on what those regulations mean and kind of like pull them, pull them apart and what they actually mean for innovation moving forward. So the, re the, the regulations are really cool because um, they leave open a lot of space for, for regulation. I, I don't believe that they dictate that you have to use oak. Um, so you can do things like cedar casks, um, um, which aren't in the SWA, the Scotch Whiskey Association. Um, when it comes to the koji that you're talking about, uh, to me, what's up in the air is, is not they re they require a malted grain of some kind, but they don't disclude koji rice distillates. And the reason why I think what? this is important, I want to. Sorry, go, go ahead. <laughs> they don't disclude koji based distillates, which are specifically prohibited in the SWA. You in to make whiskey. Um, in the sort of Scotch whiskey tradition, which Japan bears a lot of similarity to in a number of ways historically. So that's why we can kind of use them as an example. You can only use water, barley, and yeast, right? And then you eventually age it in a, in a barrel. So there's um, extraction. The addition of koji is an extraneous um, foreign substance that's allowed in other kinds of spirit production. They do it in American whiskey. I'm pretty sure they do it. They do it in Canadian. They do it in tequila and mezcal. They add nitrogen to the fermentation, for instance, right? Um, you can't add something besides yeast to whiskey historically. Now, if, if the laws just say that they require you to use malted grain, that doesn't disclude you from blending your malted grain whiskey that you made with barrel aged shochu and calling it a Japanese whiskey in the new standards. So what I'm worried about is three years from now. So regulations came out a month ago or so. Say someone made a distillate, like uh, a malted barley, like last week distillate, right? Properly fermented and everything distilled in a pot, in a pot still, all right? And put it into a barrel. In three years, that'll be a strict Japanese whiskey. Now, can you, can you add 10 times that amount of barrel aged shochu? And because it includes a malted grain of some kind, it fulfills the new definition. That's what I'm more interested. In. That's that's the kind of the gray area of the new laws that I'm interested in kind of exploring because that's gonna happen so in three years. I'm gonna believe. jump in here real quick. Uh, I've, I'm, my understanding of working with koji in general, but specifically for rice, is that you are not malting the grain. You're fermenting it with a mold. There is no malting there. So yes, what you said of, well, could they blend it with 
a cozy distillate later, as long as they have malted distillate. Theoretically, yes. And, you know, I hope that they would fix that too. Um, but my understanding is that koji fermentation, if you're doing a koji rice, koji mold fermentation on rice, that does not give you malted grain. Um, America is one of two countries. I cannot remember the other one right now. I just looked it up the other week. Um, that allows rice whiskey. Um, Japan doesn't allow it. Scotland doesn't allow it. Um, if it's not whiskey in the country of origin, why should it be allowed to call it whiskey anywhere else? Um, Crispin Kane just chimed in. Crispin is a well-respected distiller in the distiller community, been in this business for probably longer than I've been alive. He said he's never tried rice whiskey. He's got to catch up. Uh, Crispin, I am, again, just going to reiterate this, of the opinion that rice-based distillate is not whiskey. Um, you know, plain and simple as that. It's something different, but I don't think it should be considered whiskey. Well, you know, you got to be careful there because, and that's kind of where the new regulations are. We're trying to be sufficiently open for a few, for future releases. So uh, in, in full transparency, and we've talked about this before. So Tori has made a rice based whiskey and it was released as part right. of our essence collection, right? The difference was that it was not fermented with the aid of, of Koji in any way. It was fermented using, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae using yeast. Um, Jim Beam has made rice whiskey before, and that was a component that actually went into um, the latest Little Book, Little Book, I think, four um, as yes. well. So, you know, if you're fermenting with yeast uh, and your grain is rice and you're aging in a barrel, I personally have no problem calling that whiskey. And if it comes from the, the country of origin and you call and you and you want to call it a whiskey from that particular region, I'm cool with that too. It's a stickier sort of thing about whether or not, whether what they call it there, um, that sort of self-determinism. Uh, do the makers in that country call it whiskey? If not, uh, then no. If yes, then yes. I don't know. I need to think about that a little bit more. Um, I, it's mostly like, was this, I, I always go into intention. Was this made with the intention of it being a whiskey? If the answer is yes, like you fermented it in, with that, Thing in mind, you distilled it with that in mind, you put it into a barrel with that in mind, you bottle it with that in mind, then I'm willing to be a little bit more open, if that makes sense. More about intention for me. Sure, and you know, that's something we can discuss a little more in depth offline, because we did agree, you know, let's not shit on anybody, pardon my French, and you know, I don't want to insult anybody's brand particularly at all. You know, I'm just, I'm a very opinionated person. Um, I feel like that's why some people let me talk sometimes because they're like, okay, what controversial opinion is Sam going to spit out this time? Um, on that note, uh, I did jump ahead. I did go through a little bit of the Yama 18 and some of the Haku 12. Um, but let's backtrack to the Yamazaki 18, then to the 12, then to the 18 for the Hakushu because we have about 15 minutes left. It always happens this way, right? We get carried away and we forget to drink the whiskey. Um, Could be yeah, worse. Do it. So, yeah, well, at least we got the whiskey. Um, so what you was got really the whiskey, cool to me? Great conversation. I have. I, I mean, I don't. I don't. I never know how many people are are get really jazzed up about the nuances of new whiskey regulations or or oh, sherry barrels. Hi there. I sure. Me. I sure do. Me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Me. Hi there. Yes. Uh, Hello. Big ass sign saying this guy. Yeah. Um, so what's really cool, but you know, to to ground us back to what we're tasting here, um, and to me, another yet another innovation that Suntory kind of introduces in our bottling line is that this, the eighteen year old Yamazaki, is not the twelve year old Yamazaki six years older. Those, they are entirely different blends and recipes. The DNA inside the 12 is not the same DNA that goes into the 18. Now they're made from similar components, but the ratios change, the, the ideas change. Like there's way, 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 way more sherry cask 
um, in the 18 year old Yamazaki than is than exists in the blend for the 12 year old. Um, and again, that goes to the importance of why sharing year? Fast is, is 18 year. Yeah. Yeah. Different whiskeys. Um, and that's really cool. That's really, really cool that we just don't wait 18 years because it allows us to do something really cool for me, which is that, you know, there's, there's a pet theory there in the whiskey tasting world that, uh, the best time to just, uh, that's what? Wild, so. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, the best time to taste a whiskey, if you want to nerd out and kind of distinguish distilleries, is between 12 and 18 years old. Once you get to past about 18 years old, the barrel kind of starts to take over. Don't get me wrong. It tastes delicious. It, it gets better more often than not with age. It tastes wonderful and everything. But if you want to, like, distinguish the difference between Stress Isla and Mortlock, you know, once you get past 18 years old, there's so much of the barrel's influence that it's hard to distinguish um, what's going, what happened at the distilleries. And really by really tailoring the 12 and the 18, these different age statements um, from the ground up and making them completely different. I feel like the blender has really allowed you to really still get that overripe pineapple flavor, that high estuary, like big weighty spirit from Yamazaki still, still shines through. Those flavors still come through even at 18 years old. Um, and that's a really cool innovation and, and distinction within the, the whiskey industry. Like the 18 is just a completely different beast than the 12 year. Um, and that's by design, which is just so cool. They're similar enough that I get some of the same notes, you know, those apples, some of that pineapple, like you were talking about, the high esterification of it. Um, but they're at the same time, you know, the 18 year, whereas the 12 goes to the left, the 18 keeps going straight and then goes right later. It, you know, it's a little more mature, obviously, in terms of age, but then it like it takes a hard fork in the road and it goes off in a totally different direction. That sherry influence is much more prominent. It is definitely more, you know, on the dessert side versus the savory side, which the 12 year is a little more on the savory side, it's more on the sweet side, the 18. Yeah. Um, both tasty, both delicious. They they both come from Yamazaki. They have that in common. They have that typicity, but they are um, distinct whiskeys, um, which is a fun way to go about creating new products um, and very unique to say it again. Um, what's next? Are we doing going back to the 12 or Haku 12? sideways? Hakushu 12. Going to Hakushu 12. Uh, all right. So this is our mountain distillery. Um, it is up in the southern Alps of Japan um, in Yamanaki. Yamanashi Prefecture, sorry, uh, oh, quite a ways away from Tokyo. Um, it's a really beautiful distillery. It's way up in the mountains. It's about 2,000 meters above sea level. Um, I believe I have that right. Uh, and it's literally in the middle of a big bird sanctuary, a big um, conservation, um, surrounded by red pine forest. It's beautiful. Um, and this is probably one of our most advanced distilleries. Uh, it's a, very similar to the Yamazaki. It's got multiple different types of stills making multiple different types of products um what i like to draw people's attention to is like when you're tasting it what most people are going to get hit with immediately is going to be um the smoke there's more peat to this blend um than our other whiskeys but underneath all that there is this really minty herbal piney kind of um grassy quality to it as well that's really that's really really wonderful um, and it's and it's them just kind of living in nature and kind of trying to take inspiration from that beautiful environment around them, um, and this and the quality of the smoke, um, they're able to manipulate it and kind of enhance it in a very specific direction as well. So instead of being really briny and iodiney and kind of like a a, a band aid or a beach fire that you get from a lot of islas, this is more of like a a softer, drier more delicate sort of um, campfire kind of aroma. Um, it's a little bit drier. And, and when I say drier, I mean like less wet and mossy. Um, more And a little bit also, strangely enough, a little bit sweeter at the same time. And by that, I mean a little bit less bitter. So it's 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 just a delicate style of peated whiskey. And it's, and it's really fun and unique um, in, in the realm of Japanese whiskey. And, and again, it comes from uh, those different components coming together and how, how they kind of manipulate and show the hand of the maker. 
I start to touch more and then add some water to it. Because I want to see how this breaks apart, for lack of a better term, uh, under some water, how, you know, the different components start to show up when you add a little water to this. Now, what does Hakusho yeah, mean? And, Did you mention that? Uh, it's, I mean, it's like White Castle, um, but it's, but it's also kind of like a, a reference to like the white sandy plains of the river that's nearby there at the base of uh, Mount Kaikomagatake. So it's it's a it's a reference to like a, a river beach that's nearby. Yeah. So add a little bit of water, man. That's so that's that's the big reason why these it's so cool that our single malts are these blend of diff distillates. Like it's you can put our whiskeys over ice or add a drop of water, and they're going to develop in the glass. They're going to evolve. Um, that you know the smoky parts are going to come or, and fade away or grow. Mm -hmm. uh, the sherry cask influence is going to do its own thing. The water Did ruined something it. bad happen? Not for you. That which, is which, the which, worst which, Japanese whiskey. After adding water to the Hakushu Twelve, that was the absolute worst. What type of water did you add, Sam? Topo. Well, here's the thing. I would. I, I'm. I'm not going to ask you to try it again, but I will ask you to consider it because Topo Chico is a very high mineral content water, right? I will Hakushu, try it with the I, water from the Suntory spring or whatever, well, you the water you told us about you, the other day. You, you don't even have to do that. You could get some distilled water or just like a plain bottled water. But the water in Japan is very, very, very soft. Um, very, it's actually quite similar uh, to the water in Scotland. So if you were going to, if we were doing a tequila tasting or a mezcal tasting or even a bourbon tasting, I think Topo Chico is amazing because that high mineral content really kind of is similar to the type of water that where the whiskey and those tequila and mezcals are made, right? But when you're gonna add water to say um, a Japanese whiskey, I would I try it again, try the Hakushu, but with a really soft water, with a really low mineral content. Um, and you might okay. get a different, you might get a different result. Or the same, I don't know, but that that's that's how I think about it. And uh, Part that's, of that's my what job. we encourage. Part of my job, like yours, is to, pardon me, the Topo Chico is getting to me. Part of my job is to, you know, explore and try these things and try new things. Um, so I still, I never, I, not never, I rarely finish a sample on stream. I always say something to revisit for like a review day later. Um, so these will obviously get batch. They'll be part of my uh, next batch review day. And they will all get their own individual review. And actually the Harmony and the 17 and the two Yamas and the two Hakushus will all be compared to themselves in a separate review. Which is something fun I like to do. Yeah. It's good to be thorough. Whoa, the Hakushu 18. But, yeah. So this is where that smoke, those fennels, um, or phenolics, whatever the best way to describe it are, of, of the peated whiskey really kind of mellow out uh, with the barrel over time. And you really get that they're herbal, kind of mi minty kind of notes. I mean, like to me, they're still there, but they're more on the palate in terms of like a weight and a finish. Um, and they're not, they're not completely gone, um, but really coming through more is like that that quality of the raw distillate again this is this is what happens when you when you make an 18 from and you design it from the ground up you just don't you know let your whiskey sit in the barrel for six more years and you get that that those herbal notes that those piney notes it's almost as if you're in that forest in the yamanashi prefecture in the southern house of japan's absolutely gorgeous spirit mm. 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 Wow, that is a sensory experience. I definitely get that smoke you were talking about still on the palate. 
I didn't get it on the nose. It's very full bodied and creamy and rich. Not oily, it's not viscousy. Um the smoke is prevalent throughout, but there's some fruitiness. There's, you know. It's actually, to me, not a particularly complex palette. I find notes of apple, of smoke, a little bit of milk chocolate, and, you know, of course, some of that, you know, bur that barrel influence, not bourbon barrel, but barrel influence of, you know, woodiness, and a little bit of, like, honey, maybe. And for something, to me, that may not have like 800,000 things going on. I appreciate and respect the way this was made, that it was very intentional about how they put this together. And of course, you know, whiskey is subjective, but God, I'm afraid to ask, but is this even still available, let alone the price? Oh, I don't, I'm, I'm not exactly sure anymore. Um, you know, and when it comes to availability um what what allocations we do get um they don't tell me and i'm and i'm pretty thankful that they don't because <laughs> uh that then i would then i would be able to answer those questions um instead of saying kind of blissfully ignorant the, the good thing about my job is that i get to to sing the praises as opposed to um being a salesman um more often than not so i believe it's still available i mean like i don't, I don't believe it's been discontinued uh it's it's we i wish we had more of it is is the long and short of it um in terms of the pricing i'm i'm sure i don't know the good thing about suntory is that we're actually a private company um and that uh and when i what i say that with pride is because you know our the price that we that we sell yamazaki to a restaurant or a store has been i don't know it's like 75 dollars it's it's nothing extravagant but it's been that it's been that way for a, like the last four or five years, we haven't increased the price on our end at all. We make the same amount on a bottle of Yamazaki that we always have. Um, so the pricing that you kind of see in stores or online, um, that's all things that are out of our control, really. Um, and, sure. you know, that's, that's really not us. Um, so, you know, I'm glad we got to try it. I'm glad, you know, we get to talk about it. I'm glad it exists. If like to your point before, if you go to the distillery, it's, it's absolutely available and it's always better at the distillery. Everything's better at the distillery. John, you know, we're running out of time, so I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate your time. You know, it was great to actually speak through the Haku and Roku. That was probably, you know, for me, the most exciting part of the day was tasting through the vodka and gin. Because like I said, I love a good gin. I'm just starting to explore vodka. The whiskeys are fantastic. We both know that. Everyone knows that people are here for the whiskey to a large extent, but I'm here for these two, you know, like these two, like the number, but also these two, like also these. So um, do you have a toast that you want to leave us out on? Man, I haven't had a chance to do a toast in forever. Um... I, I, I'm going to keep it short and sweet and it's, it's until we can meet again in person and have a highball in person. I'm going to really look forward to that first time you, everybody who's, who might be watching that we all get to walk into a bar and hang out and see an old friend in person and put our glasses together. And that's the thing that kind of keeps me getting up day after day. So cheers uh, to that. I cannot wait for that. Cheers. Guys, tune in next week. I'm joined by John's co-worker, actually, and colleague, Michael Legan, the Irish National Brand Ambassador for the Kilbegging Distilling Company. Uh, so cheers. Oh, we'll see you next week. Bye.